She's hidden. I don't need somebody. On, I don't need her on camera laying down. I say the pews are full, but we're all laying down tonight. Yeah, but you're not laying down. You got to sit up. Okay. All right. Well, she can do this to stay awake. He won't. I know him. The sun's going down. He'll be out. And he was out in the hot grass today cutting, so. Yeah. He got her cut. That part of it, anyway. All right. Father, we thank you for tonight. Thank you for your blessing upon it. And I just ask you, Lord, that you will just bless as we go through this evening. And I pray that your word will come forth and break forth in our hearts so that we may know you better and uh, understand your ways. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I spent last week, thank Mindy for taking the class. I, she asked me, I said, you got anybody teaching? I was like, no. Patrick, I think, was ready, but I asked Mindy to go ahead and fix something up and fix this up. And so she covered most of five, and I'm good with that. Uh, I watched some at the end, and I was able to talk to y'all. Uh, General Assembly was an interesting mishmash for those who have heard. I, I spent the week... And, you know, the funny thing, I talked to one of our conservative guys uh, Monday, or no, Tuesday when I was in here, and I was telling staff today that there were people that would pull him aside and say, you're not supposed to caucus. You're not supposed to coalesce. Uh, you're supposed to just let the Holy Spirit lead everybody in the General Assembly meeting. Hogwash. Yeah. We are led by the Spirit of God to get together and figure out the battle plan. And that's basically what happened because... If left to its own regards, um, the, the minority of this church would push us to do full inclusion of gay and lesbian in leadership, ordained ministers, ordained elders. Um, and as I was talking to one fellow that was with the welcoming, and I said, once you open that up, there's no stopping. You, you can't say no to anybody. Because the, the alphabet, like I told him, I said, I don't even know what all this plus covers anymore. You know, I said, once you open it up, I said, there's no stopping. You can't say no if it was a, somebody was a pedophile. Because that's, what is that called now? Maps? They're uh, minor attracted. People. people. Minor attracted people. So people that are attracted to minors have their own names instead of pedophiles anymore. We, we name them something different because it's more palatable. All of this is sin, and the problem we run into is we, we redefine sin, you basically say we do not need to repent. And if you do not need to repent, you do not need Jesus. You have redefined the gospel totally. If you've got categories of people that do not have to repent, and that's basically where we're the church, where the Methodist church are right now. Um, they're, they're there, the United Methodist. Global, not so much. United Methodist, they're redefining the gospel to fit a culture, and uh, God have mercy on us. You have mercy on us. Ephesians 6 chapter. Um, for all of us that are parents, we've used this from time to time. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for it's right. I mean, you go back to the Old Testament, getting it, honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment, with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Great promise. But also as a parent, those times you got really mad and you looked at him and said, you're going to shorten your life if you don't change, you know. And that, that brought you in this world and take you out. No, not really. But you look at it and you go, that is that one with the promise. And if we can get our children to understand that obedience to those things, there are parents that are, that are evil, bottom line. There are parents that are evil out there. And a child knows right and wrong. They understand that. Um, there's something that's wired. I think Mindy said that to me when we got in the car, but also said a session Sunday about in Psalm 51 that God wired us there. He made us known in the womb, he made himself known. And, and I do think that when we come out of the womb, when we, we are tempted in our sin nature. It's easy to lie. It's easy to sin. I, I know I've argued with ministers before it said there is no sin nature in innocent children. Um, no, there is. We all have sin nature. And they say there's no way, you know, and, and we, I've argued with, it with a liberal minister before. I said all of them have 
the imprint of God's right and wrong on them. But as parents, our job is to teach them to obey, to have a listening ear, and to know that this is one of those that has a promise. Go with you. You're going to have a long life. Um, we all probably can dot out many illustrations of people that have had that uh, rebellious streak, and it can come to a crumbly end quickly in that rebellious streak. Because God doesn't bless rebellion. I don't care what age we are. He does not bless that. Will he call us to repentance? Yes, he always does. If we listen. But for the rebellious, it is hard to hear. Um, I would dare to say that the ones that are preaching for a full inclusion of the alphabet community into the church, um, there's a rebellion against the gospel. God is speaking to them, but you can ignore it and say no. A child can make a decision, and that's why we raise them up. We raise them up to understand to obey is better than just to come back and say, I'm sacrificing my repentance and stuff. To obey the first time. We used to tell our boys all the time, slow obedience is no obedience. You know, that gets you into a world of hurt. Because you're out there swirling out here when you know right and wrong and you're choosing just to delay, that gets you into that, I'd, I'd say in that murky world of underworld. And all kind of things happen. I, I never could understand growing up why 12, 10, 12, 15 was not the same as 12 o'clock midnight with my mother. I could not figure that out to save my life. See, it broke her heart. It made her mad. Now, we didn't have cell phones, didn't even have beepers at that time. And I can't imagine. That would be torture. With what we know now, we good. Didn't have Do what? We didn't have watches either. Didn't have watches, hardly. We had pay phones. And Mama said, you can always call me. And I was like, we were on our way home. We're always on our way home. Yeah. And I'd roll in at 1230, and I was supposed to be home at midnight. And uh, I, I never could until I got older, figured out, because... And I tell people and tell the kids at camp, I say the witching hour happens at that point of disobedience. 12, 1201, the witching hour starts. Because rebellion is a sin, is witchcraft. And so when we step willfully into rebellion, we're stepping into an area of darkness. 1201, 1202, 1215, 1230. You get into an area where I believe there's a covering and authority that God honors to obey your parents. If our parents say, and it, as long as it's not an ungodly demand, if parents say, do this, the training of a child's soul is to get them to do it within whatever that time frame. If you're, if you're lenient with that, then you, you be careful with it. You know, if you just bend and bend and bend and bend, but there's got to be a point in a child's life. That's why even James Dobson talks about the stubborn will child. They've got to have parameters. And the parameters are to train their soul to be obedient to God's voice. That is our job as parents, grandparents, is to train their soul to hear God's voice. So when you see this passage of Scripture, it says you've got to honor them. God honors those commands that are given. And if we can ever get our ch children, you've got two boys, get them to understand why it is not to deprive them of the cookies and cream and all the stuff that goes with that. But as a parent, you can look at it from a different perspective. God looks at it from a different perspective than even what we do. They can, he can see 15 years down the road that all those little Debbies that I thought were all good for me are not really good for me, you know? When you go to the doctor and he looks at you and said, lose weight and don't be so stressed, thank you, doc, and I paid you what for that, <laughs> you know? Every time I step on the scale, you know, you need to lose weight. I say, thank you very much. I, I said, I've looked at 180 one time, and I thought I looked like a skeletal rail. But I said, I'll work on that. That's something, I, and I have. I've lost a little bit of weight since the last time I've been to the doctor. I was out here the other night, and the fireman were running a call up here, and one of them said, Brother Donnie, you lost some weight. And I said, it's dark out here. How did, what? I, 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 do I, was I really ballooned out because I had this big T-shirt on, and I was like, Okay, I'll take that. Thank you. Whatever. Tell my doctor I've lost weight, you know. That'd make it easier when I walk through the door and step on the scales. And I, inevitably, I always wear these boots, and I have all the stuff in my pocket. Step up on the scales. 
And I mean, I'm wanting to strip down, you know, and I think it's kind of embarrassing to get down to my undies just to have my weight, you know, just so I can say I lost weight. And I was like, you know, these shoes are heavy. Uh, we'll, make, we'll take it up. We'll, well, stop telling me I'm fat then. Let me just go ahead and take my shoes off. Anyway, children, obey your parents. The training of the soul, your mind, your will, your emotions happens in those simple commands. And as parents, as grandparents, if we see the parameters are dangerous at 5, 6, 10, 12 years old, if those parameters are there and they're, they're flexible, too flexible, then what happens is we're endangering those that we're supposed to have guardian over. You endanger their own lives. I didn't realize my mother was protecting my life. I always thought she was just hampering my fun. I didn't think she had any. But, you know, my mama had lived. She was a teenager at one time. You forget that. She knew motives. She knew hearts. And, uh, and uh, probably because she was a teenager, she wanted to be home earlier. And, uh, but I find it fascinating as you look back now and, and what is expected. And we got so many, uh, let's just say, I know you Sunday guardrails that we can put on our kids now that we didn't have back when I was growing up. It just wasn't there. You just, here's the keys at 15 years old, take off and drive. And I was like, by myself. And it was kind of wild. But that would never happen today. And my boys are beyond that age, so I can say that. And uh, but that would never happen in this day and time. But in our day, it was a different day. It was just a different time. So we may go well with you, and you may enjoy a long life on earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Mindy, always get on to me because I could aggravate the stew out of my kids. doesn't say do not aggravate your kids. Don't exasperate them. She always saw it as the same thing, you know. I don't know about that. But I could aggravate them, and they'd get exasperated with you. There are other ways kids get exasperated with us, if not holding true to what we say. As parents, as, as adults, if we bend the rules for ourselves and hold them to it, they look at you and go, what is this? You know, and they see it. They see whatever we do, and they will follow what we do. So we don't exasperate our children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. And how we do that is not, you know, don't do as I do, do as I say. Not that. My mama told me that. Because I'd, I'd, I'd call her out sometimes. Don't do as I do, do as I say. I've made mistakes. I was like, I know. We've got to do as we do so that they will do that. Because they will do as we do. And the problem is, if we are semi-good at something and evil, they'll get better at it. They'll refine it. They'll make it. They'll go beyond what we can even imagine. And, and we go, whatever little bit of crack that we leave in our lives, our kids, grandkids, they will follow it out. And you find yourself going, wow, I don't know how this came about. I don't know what happened. Now, sometimes it has nothing to do with the parents. Very rare, but sometimes nothing to do with the parents or grandparents. Kids just make some bad decisions, and they're in a bad spot, and all that goes with that. I, I've watched kids come from good homes, and, you, and the parents seem to be straight up and down, and all of a sudden the kids are just, I mean, they're out in left field. Um, we had several uh, ministers that I know at GA. They came up and told me, they said, I've got a child that's gone uh, gay, or I've got a grandchild. They're living with us. I love them. And they would tell me that. So I love them, but I tell them this is not right. And it was nothing to do with part of their lives. And they all, as far as I know, they lived a good life. But the kid has gotten influenced by people. And the, the power of influence in this day and time, the pressure on this generation and being influenced in a bunch of different ways. How in the world, I, figure, I think I was talking to, um, Hannah's dad, Andrew, he was out there as an elder delegate. And I was like, all these kids that have to deal with so much death now and their age. And if I were to go around the room, you probably had one or two people in your school mates, maybe, that died of different reasons. Maybe a car wreck or, but it wasn't suicide. It wasn't drugs. It was you didn't see that. Did you have anybody die in your class? You did? Yeah. When you were in high school. Yeah. We had one kid die of leukemia. Car accident. He was he had leukemia, but he died in a car accident. He didn't really care 
they died. I mean, at that time, they didn't treat the leukemia like they do now. But, I mean, these kids nowadays, the influence is out there. And that's why it's so important we are the influence, you know, because they are being pressured to do things we never even thought about. You know, sometimes you could find one or two. There was always those one or two guys that would pressure you to do things. I don't want to do that. You knew it was wrong. I don't want to do that. But now the pressure is unbelievable. You know, we've seen sympathy suicides at Oak Mountain. Um, that's all you can call it because their friend commits suicide. Month to the day, this person commits suicide. And it's just amazing. And so Andrew and I was talking about that and the influence of these kids have on one another right now. Or the parent, and, and what's appalling is the mom that's the cheer mom and she badgers another girl into suicide. That's happened several times. And just online bullying of a mother to a child, you know, that's, that should be murder charges, you know, in my opinion. But I look at it going, but we see the influence right now. So it's important. Those that are in our sphere of influence, we bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord, but not exasperate them, meaning, I believe, not just aggravate, but I believe setting the example before them consistent example before them not do as i say not as i do but do as i do as paul said follow me as i follow christ that is what our call is to do and yeah true exasperate them because they never measure up true i'd agree with that um i know it, 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 like taking example, I know my boys, there's a, a high expectation. I know that. I just know it. There's a high expectation in our lives. None of them like to work with me. I don't know why. I've yet to figure that out. Um, I don't exasperate them. I just say, let's work. And uh, especially when we're doing construction or yard and stuff. But now they're okay with that. You know, when we're growing up, they're better now. Because somebody will compliment them in their work stuff, work ethic. And they go, well, my dad wouldn't expect anything less. Well, tell them what they call you now. Uh, I don't know. They, what you are call them shark. Shark. Because you can't stop. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you can't sit still. There's a shark. i got to keep moving. So that, that's something new they've started. They got him in their chair, and it'll just stay new. Yeah. Won't, won't I'll sit in it. I rocked Junie Bug to sleep in it the other night, a little big old lazy boy I got, and we rocked to sleep in it. That was neat. So anyway, yes, that expectations are there. They not can measure up and those kind of things, true. Then he goes into this next part, and it's, it's, this is a little bit on the controversial of today, but Paul's trying to address a societal issue. He wasn't endorsing slavery. But he was trying to tell them, how do you live within the boundaries of what this society? Now, all of us that live in America, we know the slavery issue that happened here. They probably used this passage in the South when they preach it to keep slaves and would preach it that way. And because in the South, in a lot of the churches, they would have the balcony where the slaves could actually go and sit until, they, until the breakaway happened. But it says, slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Not necessarily controversy. Is it something that he's holding to the institution of slavery? No. He's addressing how do you live in the confines of what this culture is? Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but the slaves of Christ doing the will of God from your heart. He was telling him, and this is the hard part, because in our society today, um, social justice says you throw off all restraints and you disrespect whoever is disrespecting you. You know, you go after it. The whole Black Lives Matter, I never bought into that, and I still won't to this day, because it was, it was a wrong premise on it. And I'm not sitting here as a mixed white guy telling you that, but it was just wrong. There are parts of that that just did not play out too well. It was built in hate and rage. Yes, there are injustices. Yes, there are things that happen. 
but we live in one of the greatest nations, one of the freest nations, and I, and I look at so many of these guys that have worked themselves from the poverty level up to here. They didn't do it in full rebellion. They did it by figuring out how can this system, did they have to, and it's kind of like we used to have a fellow named Fred that worked for Bill Humphreys, and he, we did all Bill Humphreys sheetrock. Fred cleaned up all the job sites. Fred could not talk to a white man without stuttering. I mean, he was, he had an impediment that he could not even, he would talk to you and he was, da, 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 da. you listen to him talk to a black man, he could talk seamless. The trauma in a man's life. But I have never, and it wasn't because of position, Bill Humphreys was a home builder, he built most of Chandelar down here. He respected Fred in such a way that nobody would diss Fred. Everybody knew Fred's job, and when Fred said, we're going to do it this way, you did it that way. And when he was on the job, Fred would make sure Mr. Humphreys' jobs are clean. And I watched Bill Humphreys. He had great respect for him, bought him a Cadillac, you know, and Fred loved that case. He said, y'all going to bury me in this Cadillac. He wanted to be buried in it. <laughs> but I, and I saw, those were injustices we saw all the time, but I watched Fred. Fred had, even though he had a stuttering capability, I knew there were some things that have happened in his past. Everybody respected him because he demanded that because of the respect he showed to others. And so I watch if there's Martin Luther King Jr. is one of those that said, you know, it is about the content of character. It's not about nowadays you watch some of these guys that I believe come from entitled places and they play the victim card and you're kind of going, no. If you go to the parking lot and you're getting into a $40,000 Jeep and you're telling me I got white privilege, you know, come on back another day. And it's not working for me. Everything happens, and like I told him, I said, my white privilege was sheetrock dust. I had the privilege to sand sheetrock. And that turned me as white as it could be. And I, there's nothing worse than those sheetrock dust. So he's telling him, he's saying, in the confines of this cultural society, he was not endorsing slavery, but he said, be a witness. Wherever you are, be a witness. He's trying to give him some, how to do this. He goes on telling him, he says, serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not men. It's important. If you feel like you're a slave at your job, and there are people who feel like they're a slave at their job. They feel like, no, you don't, we would go into particular neighborhoods doing sheetrock, and in those neighborhoods, because I was a sheetrocker, I'm a low man. They would talk to me like they owned me. And I would, I mean, honestly, I wouldn't put up with it, to be honest. I tried, I'd be nice, I'd say, you know what? Uh, I will do everything I can to help you. But I said, I, some of the demands they'd put on me, they want me to bring sheetrock dust into the house, and we're renovating the house. And I was like, you got to be kidding me, right? You know? Bring it in. They want me to go outside and cut the sheetrock, then bring it in to cut and to put it on the wall. And I'm like, I need to make all my cuts here in the kitchen so I can get all my measurements right. I don't want the dust in the house. I was looking around going, okay, we're renovating your house. My dust is going to make a, you know? And so I'd tell the builder, I said, look, it, that's your client. But here's the way I've got to do this. There are ways that we can do, but there are places you'll go. They feel like they own you. And sometimes you go, I'm going to be respectful, but this is the way you got to do my job. You've never done sheetrock. This is the way I got to do it. He's telling them, he's saying, look, he's serving the Lord, not men, because you know that the Lord will reward everyone for the good he has done. I may miss a few blessings there, whether he's a slave or free. In other words, your lot in life no matter what it is, be Christ-like. If you own the company, if you work for the company. We don't deal with the slavery as much. There's slaves all around the world still. Slavery is still an institution around the world. Um, but he said, And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not tr threaten them, since you know he who is the, both their master and yours is in heaven. And there's no favoritism with him. Boy, he, he didn't tear down the work of slavery, but he put it everything evil. He didn't tear down the institution of slavery, but he put everything even. He said, we're all in Christ. If you're a believer in the Lord, we're in Christ. 
Anybody else have any thoughts? I know it's a controversial. Everybody goes back to this passage to say Paul did not condemn. You know, he didn't go all condemnation on the institution of slavery. Neither did Jesus. Jesus talked about slavery. Yeah. And he didn't ever say it was wrong. Or he's bad. not for it, but at the same time, he's telling you how to live in the confines right. of injustice. And I think that's, if you go back and look really at Martin Luther King Jr., the reason he made such an impact, he lived within the confines of a segregated society, but he said, we can change this, not through violence, but through changing of heart. So I, I look at it and go, man, that's pretty powerful when you look back on his life and what he did. Then we get into some of the favorite parts here in the 10th verse here, and I think it is, as we look at this, um, we all have heard this. We preached it 14 ways to Sunday. Uh, you can chime in on this. Just raise your hand and say, I'd like to add something to that because we've all heard the armor of God. We've all got the, the parts of this because he says, finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. That's his grace. His power is, is, is submitting to the power of his Holy Spirit, which is the grace of God at work in us when we can't. Standing his power. There are things that um, even as I watched this past week at General Assembly, I do believe that we were standing in God's power. We got the votes that we needed. We got the influence we needed. And you stand in God's power. Was it coalescing and, 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 and congregating together trying to figure out a plan? Yeah, I ain't no problems with that. The problem is in the church, a lot of times we don't have a plan. And we just are at the buffets of whatever Satan does to us. We should have a plan. We ought to be demolishing every argument, and every stronghold. That's what it tells us in Corinthians. We're breaking those things down. A plan means that we are at war and there's a battle. So he is pointing out here in the 10th verse, he starts this. He says that it is putting on the strong in the Lord and put it in his mighty power. Put on the armor of God so they take a stand against the devil's schemes. There is a faction in the church that would never acknowledge i don't know if it's so much in our denomination but i've seen it in the body of christ they would never acknowledge that there's a devil that's still out there the people that try to do away and say there's no more of that that's just we are far more educated to have that i mean i've heard people say that let's do that's just not a part of today's society that's these uncultured buffoons back there in the first century didn't know that they weren't real well, i don't tell you something They'd be real. We deal with those things all the time. You see them. And I, and I find myself, and in, in this room, I can take great refuge, and we all believe this, but there's a devil's schemes. When he gets up in the morning, and you get it ready to get up in the morning, he doesn't sleep or slumber. That's why he's tormented. But when he has a plan, he's got a scheme on everyone's life sitting here. He's got a plan. Just like God's got a plan. And you got to be wise to that plan. You got to know that he does not read minds. He just watches what you watch. He does not sit there and go, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm going to destroy your life, and I've got all these plans. Now, you go back and you look in even Job's time when the devil came and said, hey, I want Job. And he said, I can't get to him because you protected him so closely. He had a plan. He said, I bet I can get you to curse him, get him to curse you. Didn't work out too well for the devil, but it, Job lost everything, did not ever curse God. He did come down a step or two in humility at the end. Uh, he saw that God's, it, it was a humbling experience all the way around. He said, take your stand against the devil's schemes. You can't take your stand unless you meant there's devil schemes. They're out there. I wish our young people would understand that, that that bully in class or that uh, the assignment of the enemy that starts at a young age. I mean, you can have someone that has some kind of uh, deformed part of their body or they think they've got a nose that's bigger than the state of Texas. And for whatever reason, that is the one thing everybody will pick at. And it becomes the very scheme of the devil to turn them down. I mean, to turn them away. And he has a scheme on that. He's got a scheme on self-esteem. He's got a scheme on our confidence. He schemes to tear us down in all kinds of different ways. Um, you've seen it happen in so many people's lives. They can have, I mean, you won't even know 
They won't even have said anything about it. And somebody can show up in a room and they can peg that. And you're going, I don't even know this person. But they peg it. Whatever it is, the enemy is beating you up about. It happens. Now you say, is that something that the devil reads your mind or whatever? There are assignments of the enemy. There are things that happen. And even some people that are unaware for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers and authorities and against powers of the dark world and spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. There are layers to the heavenly realms. There are dark forces. There are levels, I think, to darkness. Just like there are levels in the heavenly. As Paul said, there was a man he saw once. He went to the seventh heaven. I hadn't even got to the first one yet. So... But I know there's a hierarchy of demonic. And the assignments are out there. And I'm grateful, and it's never going to be my focus. Because you come like whatever you focus. But it's always got to be in your peripheral. It's always got to be that, as he said, make note, it's here. It's working on us, and it's all around us. Don't believe me? Just look at the battles we're facing now. And we've all said it. I never thought I'd see the day when we're dealing with the stuff we're dealing with now. Part of tearing down the church, um, tearing it apart. There are assignments of the enemy. Um, I don't have any proof, but I mean, there are sites out there that actually are to tear down the church. That's a whole job. And there are people that are financing it big. You know, just as Soros is financing the breakdown of America and his family. They are doing that. They're wanting to break down. They want to remake it. They have a scheme. They have a plan. I believe it's from the pit of hell. Um, are the things need to change about America? Yeah. But they want to tear it all the way down and rebuild it in whatever image they want, which is a socialism. You? Yeah, I, I, and he was asking me about my encounter of a demonic, and I did at General Assembly. I had sat down and talked with a person. I do believe it was under a, a, a duress of demons, um, that person was. And it comes across, and I've seen this, and, and, I'll, and, I'll, and I'll share this with you because at college we saw this, and we've seen it here at this church, different places. You can have somebody that you know well, and I've, I've, we, were, we were going through a deliverance session with this one person back at college. And they, possession and oppression looks very similar, very similar. And you got to be able to discern to a certain extent, but it's very similar in the way you cast those things out. And I can remember it was a friend and, and we were going through this deliverance session and that person looked straight at you and said, why are you doing this to me? We weren't hurting them at all. It was just a prayer of deliverance. They wanted to be delivered. Why are you doing this to me? It was another voice. Those things happen. Uh, the person I was talking to, when I got through talking to him, I went back to my room and I felt the yuck on me. And I was like, what is that? And he said, you were talking to a spirit. You were talking to a spirit. And it, was, it entered through a wound. And if you, and here's the danger, and this is what I tell folks. When I preach and I say there's, you, you have to forgive as you have been forgiven. If you do not, you open yourself up to the schemes of the enemy. If you hold on to bitterness, victimology of today, everybody that's a victim has to be very careful. They're opening themselves up. Now, do you have to forgive? Let's just say a child's been messed with when they're young. Do they have to forgive and get back full in that relationship? I don't think so. Do they have to forgive? Yes. Does that mean they're going to be fully restored? Why do I say yes, they have to forgive? You say, well, that's, that's hard. No, it's not. If they do not, you can open yourself up to bitterness, rage, all the things that work in the dark realm. That is putting yourself in that place. That's why when we counsel folks, it's, it's not, hey, you're going to forgive and everything's going to be hunky-dory. We're all going to sit down at Thanksgiving dinner and all that. No, no. God's going to grant you wisdom on the parameters of what's going to happen here. And most of the likely, if that, and I've seen this, that grandfather has messed with that, that granddaughter, that daughter, then there's going to be a lot of limitations in that person's life. 
They will be. And they say, well, that's not fair. They should be forgiven. There'll be a lot of limitations in that person's life. And I look at it because forgiveness doesn't erase necessarily the past. It helps you to deal with what's coming in the future. And if you hold on to whatever's there, then what happens is you invite things. And I saw that in a particular person. I, I actually think I was speaking to a spirit, but I think the entry place was back when they were very, very young. And that entry of that wound and that victimology stuff has never been dealt with. Is it hard to deal with after it gets entrenched in your life? And let me just say this. And, and just in my dealings, I can't give you, I'm not a psychologist. I'm not, I don't do psychoanalysis on people. And I think those guys that do that, they do more than the book. They don't do it from the Bible. But I will tell you this, that I have seen where people have been victims. They embrace that victimology. And without forgiveness and without the working, it can open you up to a stronghold of the enemy. Then it's hard to renew your mind. Then you thinking gets off. That's how the convincing of somebody, and I, and I go back to my friend who was in Memphis, who lived below us there in Memphis, and he told me this, and I thought it was really a neat revelation for him. He said, before I got saved, I'd go to all the parties, all the gay parties, and everybody told me, he said, you're born this way. Just embrace it. And he said, this is what his testimony, he said, I would tell them, no, I'm going to get free of this. That was before he even got saved. He had a sister that was praying for him. And he would go to parties and tell them, say, no, I'm not going to live this way. I'm not going to live this way. And he got saved and got free. He got free of that whole setting. Fell back in a little bit. And then he had to move away from Midtown Memphis because that's not a place to work on your freedom. It's Midtown Memphis. Overton Park is one of the best known places for that. And I looked at it and I was sitting here. And as I listened to him say, because every one of the parties tell him, you have been victimized. This is the society's victimizing you. They're not affirming. They're not this. And, it, and the problem is that's lies straight from the pit of hell. There's a real devil that lies to every one of us, every one of us. And he tries to formulate our thought patterns. You think back on your own life, the lies that you believed when you're, I thought I was going to die when I turned 10 years old. I, I believe that lie in secret. It was the scariest thing. And it entered through an Inquirer magazine where it said a little girl dies at the age of 10 because she had that real disease that ages you. And the devil told me, he said, you're going to die when you're, for a year, I think, I lived in torment. Because I couldn't tell anybody. That was the part of the devil does that. Don't tell anybody. They're going to think you're stupid. They're going to think you're crazy. So you hold it. You don't. So in my mind, Blow the candles out 10 years old, and I'm going to fall over dead. I had no evidence that my body was other than changing because of puberty. I'm growing hair in the arms. Oh, man, I must be getting old. All that's feeding into the lie. It's funny now. I look back on it now, but all of that, it was torment. You had a little bit of mustache growing in. And you thought, man, I am getting old. All the part of the lie. The devil does that to us. Now, I look at it 10 years old. I didn't know how to handle it. Didn't know how to deal with it. Didn't want to tell anybody. And that's what the devil does. Don't say anything. Don't tell anybody. Once you expose that to the light, we can all laugh about it now. But I'm telling you, it was torment when I was nine years old. It was torment from hell. And uh, fear. I was full of fear. A lot of things. Um, more than you can imagine. And so part of what happens in our life is the enemy will lie to us. He'll set the standard, the table, and everything else. So I do, if we don't deal with so many of our kids today, and I hate to say this this way, but we've dealt with so many folks that have come through some abusive situations. And uh, I know when they come to us, it seems like a lot. But by the time they get to us, they've been through a lot of other channels and things, and it seems like a lot, but we are that focal point in ministry. But I know this for a fact, that if you don't deal with what happens in the past, nothing you can do about what has happened to you is what you do with what has happened to you. That's your responsibility. I can make all kinds of excuses. I can 
look at something and go, I don't just blow things off. I say there's a way and a pathway to get deliverance. If that does not happen, there's also a pathway that will captivate you even more. That's why I believe, because I'm, I'm sitting around talking with people who believe in their heart of hearts that they were born a male trapped in a woman's body or a woman trapped in a, a, a man's body. They believe that with everything that's in them. I say it's the last straight from the pit of hell. But first you got to convince them there's a real devil. A lot of them are not convinced of that. And then you got to convince them, look, the truth of the Bible is here. Your DNA does not lie. But they don't want, they don't go with science anymore. It's all about feelings. It's all about comparative relationships and religion. How we compare with this. I'm, not, I'm as, you know, and I guess the funny thing is, is you'll talk to someone who's in some alternate, you can pick whatever alternate lifestyle you want. I'm not just talking about gay, I'm talking about anything that's off the map. And they can be a moral person in the alternate. I'm like, no, you lost something back here. There's something amiss. And until we can repent and deal with that, that's any of us. Any of us. And if we walk off into sin and, the, and we blatantly walk off into it, then what is happening is the devil starts the plan rolling. He'll keep you in condemnation. He'll keep you in a, a place entrapment. So that is those strongholds. It says our flesh and blood, we're not against them, but it's the rulers and darkness. It's all out there in the heavenly realms. Therefore, there's your starting a new thought. Put on the full armor of God. We've all seen this. We've all heard it preached. We've preached it. We've seen it in Sunday school. There is a battle that's on. We're in it, folks, whether we want to be. I just assume to call the truce and just live out the rest of my days and, you know, do nothing. But that ain't the way it's going to work. I look at my junior bug is going to grow up in a place that I will not even recognize. I, I, I really won't. I'm sitting at our general assembly and hearing people, ministers, advocate for things that I find just totally unbiblical. How you, and, you know, to the point where I go, you're, you're promoting heretical teaching. And I say, there's, there's, in the early church, Paul would say, I'm just going to turn you over. If I'm not going to deal with you. I'm going to turn you over and, hold, you know, maybe you repent before your flesh gets destroyed. <laughs> I mean, he didn't make any mince words about it. And we're kind of going, oh, but we got to be unified. And we got to be friends. I, I can hear you. I can tell you many ministers that I talked to this week, they said, I will not. If you want to embrace any particular thing here that is totally unbiblical, I cannot. The Bible tells me I cannot have even fellowship with you. That's harsh. But, I mean, yeah, Jesus hung out with people that were rough, but they were working towards repentance. They weren't building another theology that said, hey, I'm going to stay this prostitute. I'm going to stay this person he didn't have much toleration for the religious folks either he didn't hang out with them the pharisees sadducees he would brood of vipers you whitewash sep i mean we jesus petting that little sheep in his hands and everybody come to me no he turned the tables over and say you bunch of no goods hypocrites couldn't stand it and you're like that's not the jesus that we want to unify around i like that jesus he don't put up with it in me. He don't put up with it in you. And he sure ain't going to put up with it in the world. He says he's coming back to judge the world. And he said next time he's coming, it's, it's not going to be a pleasant experience for those who have chosen rebellion against him. And our job is to preach the gospel. You can repent and follow Christ. But once we get the... And this is what... And I heard several of my friends say, I said, look, I, I got... And, I, and I'm in agreement with them. My life is too short for me to try to figure out how I can sit around eating donut and drink a cup of coffee with people that are proclaiming another gospel. But I just don't have time. I don't care to, you know. I, I don't want to debate them. I'll tell them here, boom, there you go. Um, but if they want to start another gospel, start another church over here. Do your thing. Just go... See how many people you can draw without the money that you got piled up in a denomination. And that's exactly what's happened. 
Because if you had to proclaim it and build it, and that's what happens with a lot of our liberal brethren, it collapses because they don't have the financial base. And uh, but as long as they've got taxpayer dollars, you or you got collective dollars from your denomination, you think you can change the world. But if you got to go out here, and, and most of these ministers that want to proclaim another gospel, they don't pastor churches. And the churches they pastor, in fact, I know several that have been asked to leave because they said, we're not going that route. And they've been asked to leave. But they, and then they go out here and get a job and then end up getting a job in the denomination. <laughs> and I'm going, what? Because they can't do whatever they're doing in the church. Elders, they won't put up with it. They really won't. So I'm off. Put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, it is here. You may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, stand firm. It's coming. So after we've done everything we can do, stand, stand firm. He said, put on the belt of truth. We never compromise the truth. There are things that are scriptural truths. One of the questions, and, I, and this goes back to some of the controversy going on in the global, in the, in the global church as a whole. Um, when the church stops defining sin as sin, then truth is compromised. I mean, it is. That's one question that our denomination, and I've asked it sitting in leadership meetings. I said, is homosexuality a sin? And everybody ducks their head. They go, I was like, define that for me. Let's come to agree. If, if you say it's not a sin anymore, then we are diametrically opposed. But nobody will answer that question much. Just give me that. Is extramarital affairs still a sin? Yeah. We all would say pretty much. But there are some things that are untouchable now when you ask that question. You know, if we had... Uh, most everybody, we, we wouldn't go the Mormon route of having two and three wives. Say, no, that's just not right. And Jamie, you couldn't handle it. Uh, you got more than you handle now, so. Can you imagine having two and three Debbies? That'd be awesome, wouldn't it? Hey, we're going to get up. <laughs> Jamie, what are you still in bed for? <laughs> Let's get up. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's true. <laughs> But I do know this, that most, if we put on the belt of truth, you cannot, there are certain things in their tenets in the faith that you cannot compromise. You can't just say, okay, let's blow this off, let's blow that off. There are, there are things, and they say there's, there's, there's one interpretation, many applications, is, is what I've heard. I, I agree with that. Um, Jesus did not tolerate sin. He loved sinners. He did not tolerate sin. There's a huge difference. Our message today in the cultural church is, is Jesus is a friend to all sinners. And let's leave it there. Yeah, he was a friend to draw them out of sin. He died on the cross for our sins. And so, anyway, that's the truth we can never compromise. Stand firm then, belt of truth, bulk it around your waist. The breastplate of righteousness, know whose you are. If you're saved and you know it. You got the breastplate of righteousness. That is one of the most powerful things is to know whose you are. The breastplate of righteousness is that coat of arms, is that he is identification on us. With the feet fitted ready for the gospel of peace. We're at war, right? So how do you have the gospel of peace and be at war? How does that work? It's Jesus, the peacemaker. He's the one bringing the peace. Well, Got a cramp? Yeah. Do we, peace. Yeah. Peace yeah. is breaking down that wall of hostility. Peace is bringing the two together. It's basically our soul and our spirit is to bring that peace. And the only way that peace is going to happen is for Christ to mediate that peace. That means our forgiveness of sins. Not accommodating our sins. You never have peace if you try to accommodate sin. Never. It doesn't happen. 
Um, so that's the breastplate of righteousness. And it said, put on the gospel of peace. Uh, in addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, which can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. This is part of, again, as I said, the devil can't read our mind. He shoots arrows at us to see what will stick. If your faith is weak in areas, strengthen it. That's where the fiery darts are coming. You don't have to tell them. You don't have to do even wrong. You just have to, whatever we lean into is where our shield of faith and he fires. We've got to strengthen that. If worry is a problem in your life, guess what? He'll give you an ache in your body in the morning. Then he'll describe to you what that ache is. And then you'll worry about it. Fiery darts. Has no, then you'll Google it. That's what's even worse. <laughs> All you're doing is pouring gasoline on a fire. It's like watching the commercials about drugs. And you're like, oh, wait, I think I have that. Yeah, yeah. And you find that the flaming dart of the enemy is random but it's calculated. I don't think, I don't think the devil can read our minds. He just knows our tendencies. There is an assignment on you. Is there angels encamped about you? Yes. That's not what's in this passage, though. I'm trying to deal with the other side. There are assignments that we have to watch. We got to watch for our kids. You can see in them things that they're struggling with. And the weaknesses that hit them. And you can see it. You got to build their shield of faith also. Faith can be built. It can be increased. How? The Word of God. Because the character in the Word of God does not change. Helmet of salvation. You're saved for a purpose. That helmet of salvation is your mind, your thought process, uh, being transformed, the renewing of your mind's got to happen. The sword of the Spirit, and that means that we can use the Word wisely, which is the Word of God. So when we take the Word of God, it is what divides the soul and the Spirit, that Word of God. And as it does that, it transforms us. And so when we take up the, the sword of the Spirit, that means it is that weaponry that we go against the devil, just as Jesus did. It is written. It is written. That's how he defeated the enemy, the sword of the Spirit. But if you don't know that it is written, like I, I told Session, I told staff, I said I had one woman arguing for inclusion of everybody in an alternative lifestyle because she grew up around an elder who was an alcoholic and a womanizer. He was an elder in the church. And because that person was that, then we ought to include everybody. And I looked at her and said, that person needs to be fired. Didn't belong there. Wasn't a leader. Didn't even... Should have been out. Now, that argument aside, I looked at it and I was like, it's not the, that is not a reason to change the Word of God. Because you had a bad experience with an elder who was an alcoholic and womanizer and beat his wife. I was like, he had no business being an elder. So that doesn't mean we open the gate and do over here because this person is moral in every other area. <laughs> okay, foundation's bad. Pray in the Spirit in all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and requests. That is prayer language. That is knowledge. That is knowing as you pray in the Spirit that God can bring to your reckoning, if you've got the helmet of salvation on, He can bring to your, stuff, your mind those things that are critical for your family and those around you. Praying in the Spirit. He said, with this in mind, be alert always. Keep on praying for all the saints. Pray also for me that whenever I open my mouth, Words may be given me so that I will be fearless, made known the mysteries of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Can you imagine? I mean, I always think of the Apostle Paul being fearless. I mean, look at what he's been through. But he's obviously, I don't know what his thorn in the flesh. Some say it, it was his eyesight. Some say it was this. Some say it was pride. I don't know what that thorn in the flesh, but God reckoned that with his word and saying, you know, my grace is sufficient in your weakness. But for him to say, pray that I will proclaim fearlessly, I'm going, wow, if he had fears to deal with, then we all have the same stuff. Put on the full armor of God, knowing the enemy is 
as Peter said, is a roaring lion looking whom he may devour. It's the roar we run from and the little lions we run into. And uh, he tells, to pray that I'll be fearless. And then he says, um, as he finishes this out, he says, peace to you, brothers. I'm going to go down to the last verse. Peace to you, the brothers, and a love with faith from God to the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to all who love our Lord Jesus with undying love. We're in a battle, folks, whether we want to be or not. There is no truce. There is no signing of saying, hey, I won't mess with you. You don't mess with me. That doesn't work. All it does is put you in that place that you're delinquent and uh, you're not in the battle. Now, you remember, if y'all watched that, remember years ago in George Patton movie and the, the kid that was shell-shocked. And they called it shell shock. Now it's PTSD. And George Patton didn't have any, any room for that whatsoever. He went in and slapped the kid. That's what started his downgrade of his career. He went in and slapped the kid because they didn't believe. They said, boy's out here dying. And you're in here, coward. You know, and he was harsh. And I, I still remember that scene vividly. And uh, there are times when we need a respite from the battle. Got to give it to you. But there is no retreat. There is no retreat. Don't believe me. You start looking at your kids and what they battle. You look at your grandkids, what they're coming up against. There's no time off. There's no retreat. You know, people ask me because I'm turning 63 this year. When are you going to retire? I ain't got no reason to. Unless y'all want to get rid of me, I'll go do something else. But I look at it going... As long as I've got breath in my body, I'm supposed to preach. Where I do that, I don't, it don't matter to me, but I'm supposed to do something. I can't imagine just hanging out on the river waiting for death to come get me. You know? I mean, that's why my boys call me a shark. I've got to keep moving. You do. Sherilyn's proven that. You can. But, I mean, what, they, what people ask me about is a retired life means when are you going to quit? I ain't quit. You know, whether I'm pastoring this church or not, I don't know. But I don't want to quit. I look at preachers that when they, they get to a point, they like, I'm done, and they walk away. And I'm like, how do you do that? You can't. It's who you are. But it's a Christian life. It's not the preacher life. It's just the Christian life. I always think of Mr. Hood, who when he retired, he, he instrumental in getting a lot of those things built down in Guatemala, you know. He, would, he spent his time, until his wife got real sick, he spent his time down in Guatemala. He loved those kids. He didn't retire, he fired. And he was like, let's do it. I always fascinated with him because he's an old country boy. But Yeah, I think we can build that water tire. <laughs> and he did. And so it's always fascinating. And so there's not a point we'll ever get to a place where we say, we're done. The devil is active. He is wanting to destroy this next generation. I appreciate those ministers that keep the fire till they see Jesus. Let's be that. Let's be those Christians that keep the fire till we see Jesus. Because the battle's on. And if it's not for your family, do it for your next, the next family you got. Because they're going to be struggling. And they are struggling. So... All right, thank y'all. I can't help but preach. I don't apologize for it either. But I just let you know I realize that. Father, we thank you for letting us put on the full armor of God. Lord, there is, there's no retreat. We get some respite. We get some times where we can sit back and, and enjoy your presence. That's awesome. There are times when you tell us to, to leave the battlefield. That's awesome. But Lord, we know the battle's still raging. And I ask you, Lord God, that we will uh, continue to keep that fire in our bellies. I pray that we put on the full armor of God, knowing that you've called us with a purpose and a passion, and that we don't give up, we don't quit. Until you call us home, may we be about your purpose, fully armored, knowing the devil is not going to sleep or slumber, and he's going to try to destroy and carry as many into eternity of hell as he can. But our job is to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to you come, fully armored. Thank you for that, Father. May we be faithful and be found to be faithful when you return. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful evening.
Stay awake till you get home. Sun's down. <laughs>